This is the Jason Jones Show, powered by Mudhouse Media. Now, here's Jason Jones. Aloha, everybody, and welcome to the Jason Jones Show. I am your host, Jason Jones, and this is our special Juneteenth episode. You have a Juneteenth special? The Jason Jones Show has, that's strange. It's not strange at all. It's what I call the Holy Spirit Action Plan. Because when I set up this interview, I didn't realize it would be coming out on Juneteenth. That is just what I call the Holy Spirit Action Plan. Today, we're going to be talking with Jim Coleman. He's an actor with over 30 years of experience. He's best known for his role as Roger Parker in the hit Nickelodeon series, My Brother and Me. His filmography includes Ant-Man, The Quad, Ace Ventura, American Gangster, and Law and Order. But today we're going to be talking to him, a very interesting man and great actor, about the role of his life, the role I believe he was created to play. Like Jim Caviezel, was, he was meant to play Jesus Christ in The Passion of the Christ, and it was meant to come out at that time. Jim Coleman, his career prepared him to play Father, uh, Father Tolton right now. And that's what we're going to be talking to him about. Father Tolton was the first African-American priest in America. The name of his play is From Slave to Priest, and it's the remarkable story of America's first black priest. They're in the middle. They're preparing to go back out on a national tour that was pressed on pause because of the COVID crisis. And this is a St. Luke production. The fact that St. Luke production, my, one of my favorite production companies, they are what it is all about. They are artists. They are brilliant. They are very creative. And that they're telling this story right now with this great actor about this wonderful priest uh, is perfect timing. But I, I tend to babble. So let's get on with the interview from Slave to Priest, the remarkable story of America's first black priest. I'll be interviewing Jim Coleman, who plays Father Tolton. It is the Jason Jones Show. And this episode is being brought to you by Movie to Movement, creating a culture of life, love, and beauty through the power of film. Go to our website, movie to movement. Dot com and check out our new film, Divided Hearts of America, in theaters soon, we pray. The Jason Jones Show, the Jim Coleman. Here we go. Aloha, Jim Coleman. Welcome to the Jason Jones Show. Hey, thanks for having me, Jason. I cannot tell you how happy I am to have you on your show for many reasons. We've had a lot of heavy topics and, and gritty topics, obviously, over the past couple of weeks. Now, I was going to do something different uh, for this show. I was actually going to do it on the Bruce Lee, the new Bruce Lee documentary, uh, which we'll push, we'll push back till next week because uh, I'm a huge Bruce Lee fan, but who isn't? But I am a bigger St. Luke Productions fan. And uh, wow. I became a Catholic. I really believe that God used St. Luke to bring me from an atheist to a Catholic when it was the saint, the saint from Auschwitz uh, document, oh. uh, uh, the live show that, that you guys did. And Maximilian. That, yeah, on St. Maximilian Colby. Yeah. And uh, I, as a filmmaker, am working with my partners on a documentary, not a documentary, I'm sorry, a narrative feature film on the life of James Armistead, the most important slave in American history, who is the slave that won the revolutionary, who was, uh, who was, I'm sorry, the most important spy in American history, who was the slave spy that won the revolutionary war for America. Probably the most important spy in American right. history. Most people don't know about. And in the midst of everything our country is going through, we need to tell true, beautiful stories about our country's history. And this is this story that I'm embarrassed, I didn't know about Father Tolton, Jim. Uh, is am I? Is that right? Is are there? Is that? Am I? Was I missing? Do a lot of Catholics know about? No, it's very a very little known uh, story. Uh, 
lot of people don't know anything about Father Tolton. As a matter of fact, three years ago, three years, I had no idea who Father Tolton was. Now, you're, you're Catholic. I, no, I'm not. Okay, so you're not Catholic. You're an actor in Hollywood. I read your bio, which is amazing. Yeah. So you're this incredible actor. You. Yeah, you're this incredible actor. And so you did, so okay, I don't feel bad now. So you did not know about <laughs> Father Tolton three years ago. Right. And I mean, I've been doing this tour for two years now. And you would be surprised at the number of Catholics, black Catholics that, I mean, cradle Catholics that have no idea about Father Tolton, who are completely surprised. And now they are in love with Father Tolton and they are all about his cause. So because he is now the venerable Father Augustus Tolton. His cause for canonization is moving forward. And uh, it, it is such a wonderful story. Um, uh, you have a kid that was born into slavery in 1854 and escaped slavery with his family to uh, Chicago, Illinois, while being shot at as they crossed the Mississippi River in a raggedy boat. Oh, this is amazing. By the Confederate soldiers. So this was, yeah. uh, and I'm from Chicago, so this is beautiful. He, um, he escaped to Chicago. How old was he when he escaped? Eight years old. He he escaped, and they 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 uh, escaped to Quincy. They went to Quincy, Illinois. Amazing. Quincy, and while there, the, the irony is that you know how beautiful it is. Slavery. Quincy, Illinois. I don't know if it has any connection to Quincy, Massachusetts, which was the the center of abolition since before the Revolutionary War. John Quincy Adams, mm -hmm. uh, John Adams, the Adams. You know, they were they were abolitionists before abolition was a word. And uh, right. so I wonder, I wonder if there's a connection there, but that's, it's, it's a poetic. So they escaped yeah. to Quincy, Illinois. And, um, right. Um, uh, his, his mother, Martha, uh, she sought out the Catholic church because she wanted him to go to Catholic school. And I find it so fascinating that she would do that because they were property of, uh, Stephen Elliott. He was the, the slave owner. And his wife, well, that family, introduced them to Catholicism, introduced the slaves to Catholicism. And the mother, after escaping slavery, sought out the Catholic Church. Now, for me, I would think that that would be the last thing that she would do because her captors forced this religion on her. But she believed it so greatly she believed in God and, 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 and the Virgin Mary so greatly that she sought it out for her son. That's so beautiful. Once that, she, once she, once she got freedom. There's a book I just ordered yesterday on Kindle called Plantation Jesus. Have you read this yet? No, I haven't. It's, um, and it's about that complicated relationship of Christianity and slavery and, and the black mm -hmm. community. And so that is a mystery, isn't it? Because I'm with you. Malcolm X is one of my heroes. And a lot of my friends yeah. are like, how, how do you like Malcolm X? I'm like, first of all, how do you not like Malcolm X, right? Like, right. It's, this is a man whose father was killed by the Klan, pull, you know, pulled mm -hmm. across a, a trolley track. The scandal of people calling themselves Christians, murdering your father, how do I not understand that he looked to a different religion to try to love God and serve God? Like, I, I don't, and how, how do I not understand that at first right. he was, had a laser focus of protecting the black community. Of, that's just common sense. That's what's going to happen. The mystery is yeah. a woman like this who, who looks to the Catholic religion, um, the, the religion that was introduced to her uh, by slave owners. That's a mystery, right. a real mystery. Yeah, it really is. And, I mean, even once she found it, and uh, a white Catholic priest allowed him to go to his school, uh, he was kicked out because the parishioners there didn't want their children associating with a black child. So he was kicked out and had to go to public school. So and this is there, so shameful. So he, he, he gets to go, his, his mother wants him to go to Catholic school. He goes to Catholic mm -hmm. school. They kick him out. Right. And he has to go right. to public they school. You know, this is yeah. a, as and a Catholic who loves the Catholic church, Jim, I was at a uh, school in, in Alabama giving a speech at Catholic school and they had the photographs of the class photos of every year from like the twenties. And I remember walking down the hall looking to see the first year I see a black student. And I was really hoping it would be in the fifties, forties, maybe even I'm thinking maybe by the time I get to the forties, we definitely have to be ahead of desegregation. We're Catholics. And you know, tragically there wasn't a black 
base in that photo till 1973. Yeah. And, and uh, that, that's the irony of it. It really is. He was born in 1854. And you think about it a hundred years later, Brown versus Board of Education, 1954, right. <laughs> which when the, the, you know, the courts say it's okay. So it's not a new thing for us as Catholics to see our church conform to the spirit of the age. There's the truths of the faith, but then there's the people and the people often conform, but I'm sorry to interrupt you. So then he, um, no. So then he goes to public Uh, school. He, he got kicked out. He went to public school, public school. He was ridiculed there, but there was an Irish priest called, his name was father McGear who saw something in, um, Augustus and he invited him to come to his school, another Catholic school, where he groomed him, he taught him, he nurtured him. And at some point, um, Augustus realized that he had a calling. He, He knew that he had in his faith a conviction that he needed to do something for God. And, uh, Father McGear pressed and pressed and they tried to get him into a seminary school in the U.S., but no seminary would take him. They would not take him because of his race. He would, he was not admitted to any seminary in America because of his race. How does this make and, you feel um, as a black man? You're, you're celebrating a black priest, and well, and then you're seeing this prejudice. Does this, can, I mean, how does it make you feel? I mean, have you studied the history, well, his, you know, the history around the, the, this little community and these seminaries? Well, for me, it's 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 a situation. I was born and raised in Texas, so uh, racism was never new to me. It's something that I've always known. Uh, but I I was born. I'm the son of a Baptist minister, so I was always um, in the church, and I've always felt that in order to be a Christian or a Catholic or to be you know, in line with God's teaching, you should love everyone equally. And it has always been confusing to me that people that are Christian or Catholic that are supposed to be part of the faith can hate so deeply. So for me as a black man, I, for a while, kind of stepped away. It's like, because it can't be real. You know, there's no way that there's this much hate. God cannot allow there to be this much hate, un, just unconscious bias where, you know, you hate someone for no reason. You've never met that person, but yet you hate them. You have no reason. You hate a child and you've never met them. So uh, as a black man, it, is, it has affected me immensely. But I know that as we continue forward, there has to be a solution. And I, I don't see a solution outside of Christ. You know, the St. Saint, the Saint right. Luke, I was so scandalized by the, the behavior of Catholics in my life and as a young man that I was a radical atheist until my late 20s. And it was really the yeah. St. Luke production on St. Maximilian Cole because I had radically committed myself as a young man to wanting to live my life yeah. standing between the violent and the vulnerable. This is what I told myself as a 17-year-old infantryman, that I want to spend the rest yeah. of my life getting between the violent and the vulnerable. And I wanted to know the source of human dignity. And I looked everywhere. I I studied theology. I mean, at first philosophy. And when I realized reason couldn't really answer the mystery of how beautiful human beings were. Then I read the Quran before I read the Bible because I was so scandalized by the Christians in my life. And, but finally I read the gospels, read the church fathers and was standing looking at the Catholic church, just, I don't want to go there. (laughs) And then, (laughs) <laughs> but it was the St. Luke production on St. Maximilian Kolbe that said that really helped my prejudice against Catholics wow. melt away. And I, and it's that Imago day that the God became man. I realized is the answer to the mystery of when I look at a human being since I was a boy, I think every human has it. We all have this naturally. Can you remember being a young child? Just like human beings were the most exciting thing around, right? You'd look at people and they were oh, absolutely so beautiful, but I didn't know what it was. So the mystery is the scandal of us. I'm a scandal. I've been a scandal to a lot of people in my life, I'm sure, by my behavior. Others have scandalized us and put obstacles between us and our creator. Um, But art is really, art and love and acts of charity are the two best ways, I think, to remove scandal. And, and and, And so that's really, 
Um, have you felt that that working on this project has gotten you closer to God because of as a man, as a black man wrestling with racism and Christian, the reality oh, of who really we are has. as people? It really has. I, and and I, I, I'm always so moved. Each time I do the show, I mean, I, I, I pray and I talk to Father Tolton. And I ask that he speak through me, that I can bring his story to life. I don't want to just sell the story. I want, I, I want to bring the story to life. I want to tell the story. I want people to see his journey. So I want to bring it to life. And, it, and the only way to bring his story to life is that he speaks, that he tells his story with passion so that people can see it. And now, having been on the road for two years telling the story, I've seen people's hearts, minds, and spirits transform because they didn't realize how deep the hurt was how bad things had really been. And now they are being transformed. And for me, um, as an actor, it was a job initially, but now it's more of a mission. I need to tell this story. I need to bring this story to the public. I need to let people know what this man went through, that this beautiful, beautiful man went through, that he persevered when nobody wanted him. When racial prejudice was at its height, he persevered. He couldn't go to school in the U.S. He had to go to Europe. He had to go to Rome to become a priest. He studied, you know, in Rome and he became a priest there. Uh, and then to come back where he should have went to Africa and became a missionary. He came back. He was sent back to Quincy, Illinois. And even there, after being received so wonderfully, he was such a dynamic speaker. He was such a charismatic speaker that black and white, everyone flocked to his church to see him. But because of that, jealousy arose. Mm -hmm. And he was kicked out of Quincy and sent to uh, Chicago. So it's really the classic hero's journey. So he, you know, he was basically expelled by his own community, sent to Rome, comes right. back and is loved actually was yeah. accepted by the community. Right. But then, Until then, they, yeah. now jealousy creeps in. There you go. Envy. Envy is this, right. is this the first sin. And yeah. I think envy has a lot to do uh, with race. I think racism and envy, I guess envy and all sins are intimately connected, but I think there's a special uh, connection between envy and racism and, and, and envy and anti-Semitism. I think that the black American is one of the most envied uh, communities on earth, if you think about it. Admiration and envy go hand in hand. The Jews, the same. There's a lot of anti-Semitism. Right. And, and I always tell people, if you feel envy, what you should be feeling is admiration. Absolutely. And I agree. So this man, when he should have been admired, there were those who did admire him. They, they judged him rightly, but instead of having a right response to it, which would have been admiration, it was envy. And, and I, I think that goes with anything, even, uh, say, for you and I, I mean, no, no matter what your success is, you can, you can, you can bring, you could bring joy to so many people, but there's always someone that, envies you for what you do. They wish they're, they're, they had as many followers as you. They wish they had as many listeners as you, even though what you're doing is making a difference instead of saying, wow, Jason, you're doing a great job. You, you know, they, 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 they envy, they hate you for what you do. And I, I don't know if it's uh, human nature, but uh, I think those are the people that really should look within themselves and understand that the hate that they feel really exists, and then they have to cleanse themselves up. You have to cleanse yourself of the hate in order to see the love that you can give, the love that you can receive, because otherwise you're blocking all that love. Now, did 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 uh, Father Tolton wrestle with with anger, and do we have his diaries? I mean, what I what I know about our saints oh, is our saints don't they. Do, Saints were like us, you know, they had yeah. everything we felt, lust, rage, passion, envy. They have all that too, right? So do we know from his diaries how he grappled with all of this? 
Oh, absolutely. There was one passage where he says, um, uh, I'm, I, you know, I, 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 I fight with myself, basically, how I want to bring you to these starving people, how I want to bring you to these starving people. I can talk, talk, talk about you, Jesus, but that won't feel their hunger. They need your body and blood and Holy Communion. Lord, they need the sacraments. He says, I'm 26 years old. So many years of disappointment. How long? How long? So he struggled. He wants to know, well, why am I continuing to? I do everything I can for you. I, I, I give my all for you. And yet I can't even get into a school to become a priest to uh, share your word with them. So he struggled. And it, it, when the priest, uh, Father McGear, told him that he was going to try and get him into a seminary in Rome, he says that's even more impossible. That would never happen. Wow. Now, so God bless his Father McGear. You know, we have this yeah. now that we're tearing statues down all over America. Tearing statues yeah. down is something that's always going to happen because we always build statues to people who are men or women of their age. Yeah. And, and that they're not, we should, and we never build statues to people who transcend their age or very rarely. If we do, it's a fluke. It's a, it's, it's because they were an exemplar in some other way of their age, but we need to build right. statues of people like father McGear, people who are, or, or, or Bishop Rummel in Louisiana. I don't know if you know about him. Right. Uh, we need to yeah. build statues of people, father Tolton who transcended their age. Um, but people of the age build statues. So we're going to build statues in every age that are exemplars of our age. We will never, or only by some sort of fluke, build a statue of someone who transcends our age. This Father McGear, what, why was he so uh, directed toward the transcendent instead of this, his time? Do you have any insight on that on him? Well, not a lot of insight, but Father McGear, he appeared to be a person that he saw something in a young black kid that nobody else saw. He, he took the time to talk to him. He took the time to see what was in his heart. And sometimes if you just take a moment to meet someone or talk to someone, it'll change your whole perception of that person. And I think his perception, he says um, to uh, 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 Augustus, he says, Augustus, you seem to be a good lad. And Augustus says, Father, I try to be. And he asked him if he went to school. He says, I go to the public school. And he said, no. I want you to come to my school. He goes, I, you know, I don't want you to lose. I don't want you to go to that public school and no longer be a Catholic. But Augustus said, I've been going to that school for two months and I'm still Catholic. He says, no, that's not going to work. You need to come here so I can teach you. And you had that person that saw something. It, I guess sometimes you see something in someone and you know they have what it takes to persevere. And Father McGear was that person for Father told. Praise God. And then he, Father, and uh, so then Father Tolton goes to Chicago after coming back to Quincy, goes to Chicago. Yeah. Well, when he went to Chicago, he um, went to establish his own church. He went there to establish St. Monica's Church, uh, named after the African mother of St. Augustine. Um, his reputation for holiness. I mean, every, he had a reputation that grew. He was well, his mother, as you were telling me about his mother, I was thinking of St. Monica. Is that right? Oh, yeah. I mean, is there, was there that? Did he think of his mother as like a St. Monica type? He had to. I mean, there's no doubt about it because no matter what, his mother pushed him. His mother was there for him. She was his rock. I mean, and I, and after the show sometimes, I said, you know, there's nothing like a praying mother. And that's exactly what he had. He had a praying mother, a mother that persevered, that wouldn't let him give up. She would not let him give up. And... um you know, it, 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 he he died before she did. But she saw him travel to Rome and come back as a priest, and that's what she wanted for her son. 
and he did it. And he, you know, the, uh, I, I don't think Saint Monica was, was never finished because he died. Um, he had gone off on a retreat, a three-day retreat, and he died in 19, 1897 at the age of 43. He died of heat exhaustion. And he uh, um, at Mercy Hospital in Chicago. I know right where that is. So he, he was just working himself so hard? Worked himself to death. Oh, this is my new, he's a new, I'm going to be, I'm going to be asking him to pray for me. Oh, please. It's two Catholics from Chicago. (laughs) (laughs) And what year did his mother die? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm really not sure. Uh, But she lived on, I mean, there he has, there are some relatives. I think he has a great, great niece that actually came to the show. No, that had to be incredible. Oh man, let me tell you, it was very emotional. It was touching. It was, um, yeah, it 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 it, it was really moving. It, it it really was. And um, there are so many that have seen this show, and I don't think they will ever be the same. So we are hoping to get back on track, hoping to get out there. And you know, St. Luke Productions is a grassroots organization, and they do everything, everything we can. We, um, you know, we depend on the donations and, and, and just the love of the community to get these shows out, to tell these stories of these great saints and to tell well, these stories of perseverance. Well, as a producer, I have to tell you, I envy St. Luke Productions because you guys are the real deal. You are professionals. Your productions are top not the best. I mean, the best, the best. It doesn't get any better than that on Broadway. There's nowhere you can go. I mean, the acting is incredible. The writing is incredible. The soul. And, you know, I have always heard, since before I was a Christian, I would always hear Christians say, I cringe when I hear it. We were made for such a time as this. And they always say it when things are really good. And I'm like, yeah, but okay. What does that mean, really? What are you talking about? You know, in big convention yeah. halls and people are cheering and someone's on stage going, and we were made for such a time as this. You yeah. know, now as I'm sitting here alone in my studio and you're there alone in your house and people are social distancing right. and America's falling apart and people are confused and despairing and angry. Now I think is the time where we have to say for such a time as this. Yes. And your story yes, is for such a time as this. Not 20 years ago, not 30 years ago, for today. For today. I want people at the, I know know you're on a tight schedule. Can you tell us one story about Father Tolton that you wish everybody could know? And um, and then then I really want to direct people to your site so that they can start scheduling you or finding out when you're going to be near them. Absolutely. Um, He was introduced as the first at the, First African, uh, the first Catholic, the Colored Congress in Washington D.C. He was introduced as the first Black priest in America. And one thing that Father told him, he, one of his messages was that Jesus commands us. He said in Saint John, "I have a new commandment for you." And when he spoke to the people, he said. Jesus commands you to love one another just as I love you. And whenever I think about that passage, when he says that in the show, Jesus commands us. He didn't ask. He didn't suggest. He didn't say it was a good idea. He commands us to love one another just as he loves us. And love is the only thing that's going to transform us to the people that we need to be. That's beautiful. And now is, uh, now we're in the love Olympics. Now is the, it's challenging to love, isn't it? We watch the news. Yes, it is. I'm a very, uh, I don't know about you, but I'm easy to incite my passions. You cut me oh, off in traffic. Yes. I'm probably going to give you the bird. <laughs> I mean, I, don't, no. I gave a guy the bird while praying the rosary and the rosary was hanging from my hand. <laughs> I'm like, Lord have mercy. Oh, that man. guy, he's like those Catholics, you know. 
<laughs> so, so, but what I have been really trying to discipline myself is empathy. I want to understand why everybody, because I don't know how you grew up. I grew up in a, in a neighborhood that was really mixed. Like I, most of my f- closest friends were black. The neighborhood was probably 60, 70% black. Um, but the kids were more than that, you know, there, so there were, uh, a lot of older white people, but then the kids, you know, and, and I, they were my friends before I, I always tell them, I'm so glad you were my friend before I knew you were my black friend, you know? So yeah. a lot of this yeah. is just very hard for me to wrap my mind around on both sides. And I get confusing. I cry. I'm, I'm angry. And, and then I'm like, okay, Lord, do not let me be swept away. Do not let my passions right. get the best of me. Let me just right. discipline. I'm glad that I have this kind of spiritedness because I can understand when people get swept away. Um, yeah. Because I'm easily swept away. And so I love so that am I. you ended with that. So, yeah, how can you? Do you, can you mind me getting personal real quick? I don't okay. know. I don't know how much time you have. Like, how is a Christian man? How have you been dealing with this? This division. It's, this. It's, it's, well, it's it's very difficult. I mean, it's it's one of those things where I mean, I could go back in the history. You know. The, Massacre, the Wounded Knee Massacre, the Polk County Massacre, the Latimer Massacre, the Springfield Massacre, the Slocum Massacre, the white mob attacks in African American. I mean, massacre after massacre after massacre, Okoye, Tulsa, Rosewood, Orangeburg, Greensburg, the Sikh Temple, Charleston. I, I mean, this is not new. See, people, when they watch George Floyd, the thing is, this pandemic has people sitting around in front of their computers. People that would have normally not seen that video, people who would have come home from work and just went about their business, well, now they're sitting in front of their computers. They're trolling and scrolling on Facebook and Instagram, and they were able to sit down and watch a grown man with a knee on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds beg for his life, call out to his mother, his dead mother. See, they saw that, and normally they wouldn't see that. There's something that for them, it was, see, if a person has a heart, that was very difficult for them to watch. And some people couldn't watch it. They could not watch that. But for others like myself, it's simply history repeating itself over and over and over again. So. Yeah, so how do you, as a Christian man, how do you, how do you go, you know, as, as a white guy, I watch that and... I'll tell you my, my horrible mistake. My six-year-old was watching over my shoulder as I was watching it on my laptop. And I did not know. And I saw he, oh, he was crying. Wow. Yeah, I'm going to cry now. He was crying. When I, when I, I said, Andrew, go, go. And he, and he ran away crying. And then a couple of days after, he asked me out of the blue at the dinner table, Dad, what happened to that policeman that, that killed that, that man? And I said, they arrested him. And he jumped up and was dancing. And he was pumping his arm, you know, like he just scored a goal or something. Wow. And I thought, wow, that's how my six-year-old sees this. He okay. saw an injustice, and he is responding right. to justice. So, you know, as a white guy, I see all the anger and rage. But I'm like, hey, we were all united that this was wrong. You know, and I'm like, I, and that's, I think, how white people are responding. Hey, we're all united that this is wrong. Where is all this rage coming from? That if we're united, but what you're saying is, yeah, but we experience this over and over and over and over and over again. Yeah. All my life, it's all I've known. I I grew up in an all-black area. At 10 years old, my dad got stopped by the police, and I saw him kowtow and say, yes, sir, no, sir, and laugh and Uh giggle, and I'd never seen him like that. And he said to me, son, they will kill you. So when they come to talk to you, you smile. So I've known it my whole life. It's, it's nothing new. The difference now is that everyone has cameras and people that would have never seen it before are now seeing it. So, um, yeah, it, it, it hurts every time. It tears a little piece away from you every time. I have sons. I worry. I have grandsons. I worry. Does One this, day will it be them? Does this... um? Has this impacted your relationship with your white friends? 
Um, to a certain degree, there are some because they say, well, Jim, I don't understand what, you know, what can I do? You know, how can I change it? How can I help? What, you know, what, is there anything I, I don't understand? And what I have to say to my white friends is that you just have to recognize that it's real. You have to, when you're sitting there, when there are no blacks around and someone tells one of those jokes, you have to speak up. Your silence is complicity. You have to understand that there is an unconscious bias that you have to recognize and actually cleanse yourself of. So to say that, well, he must have done something wrong, what you have to understand is we've all been conditioned to see that black is wrong, the black hat, everything black, the black cat is the black, black is bad, black is black, bad. So unconsciously, that's the way it is. But I've had friends that say, well, you know, uh, I don't see what the big problem is. You know, all lives matter. All lives matter. Like, yeah, all lives do matter. I but heard. I all heard the, lives it wasn't George Floyd. I, I I would be one of those guys up until two days ago that say, "Can't we just say all lives matter?" And then I heard a, a lady say, "I'm on a I'm on a group called Pinnacle Forum, and it's just Christian leaders." And so they had a bunch of uh, Pinnacle Forum members who were black do us a forum that we could listen to. And the lady said, you know, when you say all lives matter, it's like if my house is on fire and the fireman comes and you're like, all houses matter. Can you put some of that water on my house too? But your house isn't on fire. And I said, I get it. There you go. I'm like, that is a very, metaphors are a really good, good teaching. You know, one thing I, 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 it's impacted some of my, I would say it's, it's tried to impact my relationships with some of my black friends that I've been friends with since I was six, five, six, but I just don't let it because I'm relentless. Like, I'll fly to their house and yeah. knock on their door. But one, <laughs> one thing I try to explain to people is I think the white experience is different. And so I grew up in my crazy family that had drugs, adultery, violence, everything. The racism was not tolerated. In a very, and I always wonder what. And, and so I think a lot of people don't experience it. And so they don't understand because they see how their family is. Right. I remember I dropped the N word and I was just quoting somebody when I was nine and my dad, who's wild, you know, by the grace of God, he's a Christian now Catholic now, but he was a wild man. And this wild guy, my dad sat me down and said, of all things, this is my dad saying to me, Hey, we're gentlemen. That is not a good word. You never use that word. I never saw him so serious about anything. He said, I used that word when I was about your age. And my uncle Johnny, my Johnny uncle Johnny Giobi owned the famous Tivoli restaurant in uh, um, mm. Chicago Heights. Real, it was a, a famous restaurant. He goes, uncle Johnny sat me down in the early fifties and said, and this was when the Klan would march through our neighborhood. Could you believe the Klan marched through Chicago <laughs> neighborhoods and she, crazy? He said, uh, my uncle Johnny said to me, you know, Scotty, we never use that word. Um, and we have different experiences with police officers. Dave Chappelle has a great skit where he's like, you know, when the police officer sees you, he's like, hey, Keith. You're like, hi, Fred. Yeah. <laughs> and so <laughs> what I try to say to my black friends is we don't get it. I'm going to tell you it's hard to get it. Um, and that's what I think we need to understand with each other. Like, I, we have to understand we're just not going to get it. But we have to believe you. <laughs> when all of my friends are telling me the same thing, I have to believe them, right? Even if... I can't really understand it. Right. Um, I have to believe it. But again, like what you said with Father Tolton, at the end, this is just an opportunity. It's nothing like what he faced. Right. I mean, he had to run as a boy from Confederate soldiers shooting at him. Yeah. And and if he could love, we can love. Absolutely. I think the most important thing my listeners can do is make sure they bring this show to their community uh, and support St. Luke Productions. How do we do that? We go to stlukeproductions.com and there's a link to say host the show. Go to that and uh, or you can call 360-687-8029 and say, let them know you want to host the show. And bring the show to your city, bring the show to your town, to your community, and we will do everything in our power to let you know what is needed, how we can get it there. And we're looking forward to bringing the shows back up. Uh, like I said, uh, 
September, October, November for the fall, the late fall, we want to start. Once the country opens up, we want to be there to bring these stories, to touch the hearts, minds, spirits, and souls of those that are out there that want to listen, even to those that don't want to listen. You know, so we want to bring it out there. And please contact us at stlukeproductions.com or give us a call at 360-687-8029. Well, uh, Jim, I just want to say uh, so many of us are feeling helpless. We want to do something constructive. And this production was made for this time. Maybe our Lord capped Father Tolton's story, that the fact that not every Catholic knows Father Tolton's story. Um, I believe that thanks to uh, how many people know who St. Maximilian Kolbe is, uh, a Polish priest who died in Auschwitz in 1941 because of the work of St. Luke Productions. And I think that now is the time our Lord wants everyone to know about Father Augustus Tolton and about his mother, about his family. Absolutely. About his community. Martha Tolton. Martha, yes. Martha Tolton. What a perfect name for her. And um, I just want to thank you for sharing your career, your 30 years of disciplined work to perfect your craft from the big screen to the small screen. And now people can see you live in a national tour. Right. So I think your career and uh, has all pointed you to this very time. I agree. Thank you so very much for having me. Uh, Jim, any final words for my audience? Uh, this audience, by the way, is around the way. I have a very interesting audience. It's uh, the most beautiful tribe. And it's all over They're the around. world. It's all over the world. And uh, it's growing. I love watching the little yellow dots pop off all across. <laughs> the, uh, all these bing, bing, bing all over, all over the planet. And uh, so if there's anything you want to say, you know, this show, I founded the show for one reason. To, to The work of my apostolate, Movie to Movement, is to stand between the violent and the vulnerable by sharing the beauty of the human person and inspiring solidarity. So I started this podcast just to supplement that because I know so many beautiful people and I wanted to share them with the world, but it's knit together quite a large audience uh, of people that, that what I say is, you know, um, David Mamet says he writes for the same reason beavers chew wood. They chew wood because their teeth itch. And he goes, I, the only, my teeth itch and the only way I can stop them from itching is writing and my teeth itch. And the only way (laughs) my teeth itch at the thought of children, especially children exposed to violence um, and vulnerability. And the only way my teeth stop itching is to try to share some of their burden. And I think that's what the Jason Jones show audience, we all share in common is our teeth itch. Clearly your teeth itch. So Absolutely. What would you if there's, what would you like to, to just close out and share with our folks? I would just to say thank you so much for having me. Thank you so very much to all the listeners. And I encourage you. I encourage you to go out, search your heart, search your mind, search your spirits, touch someone and understand that, you know, God is love and you are made in his image and you too are loved. So we just gotta get out there and spread that love and make a change and make a change now. Now's the time. Let's be more. I think we're going to be more united after this than we ever have been. You ever had a big fight with your wife that you, I, I don't know. I don't know if you're married, but yeah, I am. <laughs> have you ever had a big fight and you're like, yeah, that's it. It's over. This marriage is over and you're closer than ever. Yeah. And I pray that's, that's what happens that, that we are closer Absolutely. than ever after we go through this. And you're playing a big part of that, Jim. Thank you so much for your career and thank you for your work. I appreciate you. Thank you so very much. And have a great day, sir. All right. All right, brother. Get back. I know you got a lot of work to do. I took more time than I, than I, I promised you. I, I said it only take 30 <laughs> minutes. I took 45. No problem. All right. Aloha. Thank you. All right, guys. I want you to go to, I'll let that beep, beep, beep go. I want you to go to www.toltondrama.com. T O L T O N drama. Dot com. I know you can spell it because I can spell drama and I have dyslexia. I, I don't know about you, but I feel helpless. I feel useless when I look at the news and I, I have my column. I have the show. I have the movie that I have in production on this very topic, by the way, Divided Hearts of America. And yet I feel helpless. If you're like me and you're like, I just want to do something to share the beauty of our community 
I want to do something of, of value. I think that bringing uh, this St. Luke production of the life of Father Augustus Tolton to your community is something we can all do. And I promise you, I'm bringing this to my community. I am bringing this to my community for one reason. I'm selfish, and I want to see it. So go to ToltonDrama.com. I'm so, and I'm not kidding. St. Luke Productions has had a dramatic impact on my faith and my formation, uh, maybe more than anything, really, because it was that, that, it was that show on St. Maximilian Colby similar to this uh, program, this show, that really uh, removed the prejudice from my heart against Catholicism and led to me becoming a Christian. Not a good Christian. No, but a Christian. That's all. As Steve Harvey says, I ain't, I ain't that good of a Christian yet, but keep praying for me. This has been another episode of the Jason Jones Show, and it has been brought to you by Movie to Movement, creating a culture of life, Love and beauty through the power of film. Go to our website, movietomovement.com, and check out our new movie, Divided Hearts of America, coming to theaters soon when theaters are a thing again. Until next time, from the west side of Oahu, don't envy me. It's the Jason Jones Show. Aloha. This has been the Jason Jones Show, powered by Mudhouse Media. Ooh, 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 ooh.